Uh, welcome to this webinar. Um, my name is Tabitha Spence and I'm involved with the Asia Europe Peoples Forum. Um, today we have co-organized this webinar together with the International Peace Bureau, Transform Europe, the International No to NATO, No to War Network, and the Pacific Peace Network. And the name of the webinar is RIMPAC, NATO versus a peaceful Asia Pacific. And um, essentially, we have a lot of knowledge here in the Zoom room with us today, a lot of um, activists, organizers, as well as people who've seen from the ground, from where they are in the world, or from particular institutions, uh, how um, NATO and US-led uh, war machine functions around the world and the way that it relates to its allies, uh, as well as the effects of people, of uh, these military exercises and activities. So really the objective of this webinar is to analyze and oppose the largest military exercises on the rim of the Pacific, known as RIMPAC, which is currently underway uh, right now um, in the Pacific Ocean and also to consider the role of the participation of NATO countries. So we have a good group of speakers with us. Unfortunately, Walter Beyer is out with COVID. Um, thankfully, uh, some of the other speakers who may have COVID are able to join us regardless. Um, and also my co-moderator, Don Hui, uh, was un unable to join because of the family emergency, but we thank them nonetheless for um, wanting to be here with us today. So um, instead of introducing everybody at once, what I'll do is I'll just start with our first speaker, and then I'll introduce each speaker in turn. Every speaker will have around seven minutes to um, offer their initial remarks. And after everyone speaks, we will share a video, which is a collective poem on rejecting RIMPAC, um, compiled by people from across the Indo-Pacific. And um, after that, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So please do use the Q&A box. Um, if you have questions, we'll have a good amount of time at the end uh, for the speakers to engage with those questions. So first, we're going to start with the retired Army Colonel and former U.S. diplomat, Anne Wright. She resigned in 2003 in opposition to the U.S. war in Iraq. She's currently part of the Hawaii Peace and Justice Organization, and she's in Spain participating in the anti-NATO, anti-RIMPAC demonstrations currently. So she's going to give an overview on RIMPAC and hotspots in the Asia Pacific and share her experiences with us. So the floor is yours, Anne. Um, and we'll try to aim for around seven minutes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tabby. And uh, uh, here we are in Madrid, the site where all of the NATO leaders are still in, in Madrid. Uh, we did have a very dynamic uh, uh, two-day conference on no to NATO and a wonderful march uh, uh, through the streets of Madrid on Sunday. So. We've been letting people know that not everybody agrees with NATO. My presentation is going to be about RIMPACT, RIM of the Pacific, and I'll start sharing this because I think it's uh, very important that we, um, let's see, that we really look at what, oops, wait a minute, um, what it's all about. So here are all the big NATO guys and gals that have been meeting here in Madrid all uh, 30 of them plus uh, two more that uh, are no going to be accessing into joining into NATO, uh, Finland and Sweden, it looks like, uh, plus a lot of other countries that uh, seem to think that NATO is their guarantee to security. Well, it's not. And our, our peace summit, in fact, there were actually two group, two conferences here in Madrid about uh, challenging NATO, uh, a very, very good uh, uh, conferences organized by uh, Spanish uh, um, activists. So what would NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, so what does it have to do with the Pacific? Well, it it is now participating. It is part of the war maneuvers, part of the 
uh, the war games, the but they aren't games. It's the war con uh, military confrontation in the Western Pacific. I, I live on the island of Oahu where the US military command, uh, the Indo-Pacific command is located. That mili US military command covers half of the world all the way from the west coast of the united states all the way through india all through china all the south pacific um, it's a huge military place with u.s military bases in in japan in south korea uh in uh, back into the philippines uh in australia um and why is this uh why are we talking about all of this well when you look at the region uh, there's a lot of hot spots in the region, and, and we should be concerned about what's happening and about how nations are, are really uh, antagonizing other nations and creating these tensions. North Korea, of course, has a few nuclear weapons. It does have some ballistic missiles. And from the, from the United States, uh, the United States is not engaging North Korea at all. So it's firing missiles. Uh, and uh, probably going to test a nuclear weapon because it is not getting attention uh, for a peace agreement uh, that would end the hostilities, the 72 years of hostilities since the Korean War. And if just to remind, I mean, most people, unless you live in Asia, you don't realize how close everything is. So here you have North Korea, China right next to it, South Korea, Japan, just barely off the coast of the Korean Peninsula, uh, part of uh, Eastern Russia coming right down there. This is really a big hot spot uh, for uh, collisions of military forces from all of these nations. And in speaking of military collisions, uh, just a couple of months ago, the, the one of the two US aircraft carriers, giant carriers that have over 5,000 people on them and uh, many aircraft on them were all off the, the coast of South Korea. Uh, you look at other hot spots in the in the area, and if we go down uh, off the Chinese coast uh, and we look to the uh, to the right, there you see the island of Taiwan, and the one China policy that the U U.S. created during the the Nixon administration, where the U.S. and most countries of the world, I think there are only nine countries now that still recognize Taiwan as an independent country. The rest of them have gone along with this one China policy where, where Taiwan is considered not to be an independent country, but, um, uh, but relations happen as if it were independent, both economic and military relations. The US sells um, um, uh, billions of dollars of military equipment to Taiwan. And the U.S. has been sending in high-level diplomatic missions and military missions and congressional missions just to poke a finger at the Chinese. Well, the, the mainland Chinese just don't sit back and let that happen. They've been sending armadas of aircraft across the, the Taiwan Straits right to the edge of the air defense zone of Taiwan. So the, the between the the sea armadas, the ships that have been sailing on freedom of navigation issues, and then air armadas that are coming across to challenge um, the US presence in Taiwan, it's a very dangerous place. And another area that's really dangerous, another hot spot, is the South China Sea, where in the contested islands, contested by China, Philippines, Vietnam, um, all of these islands, the Paracel Islands, the Spratly Islands, all have been under, uh, you know, question, who do they belong to? Well, the Chinese have developed a series of atolls where they have uh, put sand, lots of sand into the atolls. They've built them up. They've, they've created um, aircraft landing strips. They've created um, uh, harbors. So the Chinese themselves in their front yard, I mean, you have to recognize that's their front yard. It's not the front yard of the United States. I mean, the United States is 7,000 miles away. Yet that is a place that uh, the U.S. continues to have its freedom of navigation um, ships joined by NATO ships to keep going through these nine islands that have been developed by the Chinese. Currently, there is only one, um, one military base outside of China 
uh, other than these islands, and that's in the, uh, the Middle East country of Djibouti. The United States has over 800 military bases outside of the United States. Now, another place, another hotspot, a very recent one is the Solomon Islands. I mean, who's heard of the Solomon Islands? Those of you all in Europe. I mean, those of us in, in the Pacific, we know where they are. But the Chinese have been taking a kind of a playbook page out from the US, uh, or one could say, well, that's probably not quite the way to say it. Uh, the Chinese have gone to say, would you like to have help on your security, on disaster assistance, things like that? Uh, the Solomon Islands said, sure, we'd like to have a little help. So there was an agreement signed between mainland China and the Solomon Islands uh, for disaster relief, and they do call it security. Well, calling it security has gotten the attention of the United States. And for the first time high in a long time, high level U.S. diplomats have flown to the Solomon Islands and the U.S. is about to open an embassy there. <laughs> All because the Chinese went, went there. Uh, another view of uh, uh, that part of uh, uh, the Western Pacific, that those people in Europe don't really realize what, what is out there and how important it is. And now we see that NATO is finding out uh, that it wants to be a part of it. Now, uh, Nayak, Nayak is going to be talking about the uh, another military U.S. military base out in the Western Pacific, um, the Hawaiian Islands, it has four military bases on one island and a huge training area. That's one place where the U.S. has a huge amount of military equipment. But the other one is on Guahan. And I'll just show a couple of pictures, but uh, Nick will, will go into detail. They have, on, on the tiny island of Guam, they have uh, uh, nuclear submarine bases, They've got a huge uh, airport, uh, military airport that, that can accommodate lots and lots of aircraft to include B-52 nuclear bombers. So Rim of the Pacific is really what we're talking about. The largest military naval exercises in the world that started yesterday on June 29th and will run through, June, through August 4th. 26 countries will be participating, 25,000 military personnel, 38 ships, four submarines, 170 aircraft, and nine nations that will be putting their military folks on the ground in Hawaii in military maneuvers on, on beaches. Well, in RIMPAC, we have NATO as a part of it. And in fact, eight of the NATO countries, eight NATO countries, are part of the 26 countries that are participating. So for almost 45% of all of the participants are either formal NATO countries or are Asia Pacific partners of NATO. And those Asia Pacific partners are Australia, Japan, South Korea, and New Zealand. Uh, the eight NATO countries that have come all the way uh, from, uh, from the Atlantic um, are, well, Part of them have a Pacific coast, but Canada, Colombia, Denmark, France, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, the United States are the eight NATO countries. And then at the bottom of the screen, you see all the other non-NATO or non-partners, but there are key allies, uh, particularly uh, India and Israel are a part of this. But then you have Brunei, Chile, Ecuador, Indonesia, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, the Philippines, from which this... Uh, Broadcast has been organized uh, is a part of this. Singapore, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Tonga. What do they do? Well, all of these these uh, thirty eight ships are are firing rockets, firing missiles, uh, firing torpedoes. Uh, they're blowing up ships. Every one of the RIMPAC uh, exercises, which happen every other year. Uh, Torpedo a ship, sink a ship into the Pacific Ocean. Supposedly, the ship has been cleaned of all of its fuel, all of that, but we know that doesn't happen. But they blow up a ship just to show that they can blow up a ship, to give target practice for submarines and for, um, uh, for rockets. Uh, they also go ashore. Here's a picture of some of the Marines that will be going ashore, and you can see the background, one of the beautiful beaches of the... Uh, leeward side of, of Oahu over uh, in Waimanalo. 
and they go ashore on these beaches and run over turtles and uh, sea life. Uh, it's a, it's very destructive, uh, but the military will say, oh, we take all of the precautions of the world. But then you find that there are dead marine mammals, that we will have uh, a tragedy. These happen to be uh, whales that have been found dead on the beaches of, in the Black Sea, another place with the U Ukraine-Russia war going on. Uh, you know, while most of the attention of the world is focused over toward Ukraine and Russia, uh, some of the after effects, not only human tragedy of the deaths of so many people, uh, but the marine life in the in the Black Sea. Uh, just to finish up with uh, some very interesting things that are happening with this RIMPAC. For the very first time, the United States now is sending unmanned surface vehicles, robotic surface vehicles, big ships that nobody's on board. They're being controlled from afar. And this, this is a strange one. This is called the Sea, um, sea Hunter. You can see it has pontoons on both sides of it, uh, kind of like uh, the, uh, the VA, uh, the sailing canoes of the Pacific. But this does not have one person that's on it. It's being remotely controlled. And another one, look at this big thing, carrying all sorts of equipment on the back of it. Unmanned, not one human on board this. This one's called the Ranger. And then this one's called the Nomad, another one that can carry lots of equipment. It can have helicopters land on it, all without human touch on it. Well, what about humans, though? Here, I showed you a picture of the USS Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, the aircraft carrier that was up around South Korea just a month ago. Well, it's back in the middle of the Pacific. It arrived in Honolulu last week, 5,000 people on board, 30 uh, jet aircraft that are on board. Uh, it will be one of the stars, so to speak, of this rim pack. But another star is coming from South Korea. The South Korean government is sending in its its uh, helicopter assault ship called the Marado, and two other big ships are coming in, and one submarine, and 1,000 South Korean uh, military are participating. If you look at the, the picture on the right, the back end of this helicopter assault ship, it's called assault because it has the capability, uh, as you see on the right, of all sorts of smaller vessels coming out the back end of it uh, and uh, trucks and things like that that can be loaded onto smaller ships and then taken ashore to assault the shore. How about this for a sinister looking ship? This is the Zumwalt class destroyer of the United States that has come in. This, this is an eerie looking ship, I think. Uh, NATO ships arriving uh, from for RIMPAC. Here's the French uh, frigate over on the, the left, and then a UK patrol boat that's on the right. If you look, look at the UK patrol boat and see the different designs, paint designs that are on it. Uh, Canada's sending in lots of other people too. They will be having four ships, uh, helicopters, and 800 personnel as a part of this. Then from the Pacific, we've got from Australia, the big assault ship, Canberra, will be there. Uh, the Philippines will be having a frigate that's there. Uh, New Zealand's largest and newest ship uh, is going to be there. From Malaysia, here's another one. These are big, big ships that carry lots and lots of people. Just to give you an idea of the Chilean and the Indian ships that are there that have crossed the, the Pacific. So what are we doing? We're saying cancel RIMPAC, cancel it. And these are some of the great uh, uh, modifications of the RIMPAC official logo that we've put on it. If you look up at the top of the one on the left, catastrophic, aggressive, cancel this thing. And then you look on the one on the right that we have a peaceful Pacific, a world without RIMPAC, with whales and dolphins and turtles living in the ocean peacefully and all of the military equipment sinking down in the bottom. We've had protests in Hawaii already for RIMPAC, uh, and we'll be having plenty, plenty more. Uh, we're joined with protests from South Korea, from Jeju Island, our great uh, uh, friends that are in Jeju Island. And what can you do from around the world? Well, we have a petition that we'll put into the chat, uh, and then we'll be seeing uh, we have the Pacific Peace Network that has organizations from all over the, uh, the Asia and the Pacific. And then later on in this program, you'll be seeing a collective poem of uh, wonderful poets of the of the region that say stop RIMPAC. 
So that's where we are. Here we are in Madrid and saying no to NATO. Uh, we thank you all so much for being with us today and uh, looking forward to hearing what everybody else says. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, well, those really look like drones of the sea, what you were showing us, and I hadn't heard of anything quite like that before, but um, but, but the images of, of those ships and the deadly nature of them is really uh, quite shaking, you know, it, it just shakes a person to, to see that and to know that they are being designed to destroy, to destroy lives, to destroy people, and they're also taking out, you know, the natural environment at the same time. Um, I'm going to turn to Katerina Anastasio now to talk about NATO in particular and its role in advancing this, these kinds of priorities over the priorities of, of life and sustaining life. Um, Katerina has also participated in the counter demonstrations uh, in Spain. She's feeling a little bit under the weather, so we thank you, Katerina, for being here with us regardless. Um, she is with Transform Europe. She is the NATO specialist at Transform Europe. And she's also been very involved in the common security initiatives as well as the No to NATO, No to War uh, network activities. So uh, over to you, Katerina. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, for organizing this, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit sick. Uh, I hope you can understand me. Just do something so I know that you can. OK, good. Um, so thank you for organizing this today, um, first and foremost, because um, what is going on in the Pacific and what is going on in Asia doesn't seem to be in the focus of politics in Europe right now. And therefore, a lot of people are not aware of um, the kind of aggressive expansionism NATO has now as primary uh, strategy. Perhaps um, I will just try to sum up what I want to talk to you about today. I think uh, regarding the upcoming um, NATO steps, people after me will be more equipped um, uh, to discuss them. But what I do want to discuss with you today or tell you today is how the politics of the whole NATO expansion really um, is discussed right now in the European Union, also in the backdrop of uh, Russia's invasion in the Ukraine. So um, perhaps starting with that, um, Perhaps starting with that, yes. Um, I mean, you can understand that um, Russia's illegal invasion in the Ukraine and the whole war waged there kind of shifted the focus in the European uh, Union, also in a political level, both on the European Parliament level, but also in uh, national politics level. Um, things that you are aware of already are kind of now totally mainstreamed in Europe, meaning that NATO is kind of pushed as a defense and security alliance, something that Anne also mentioned before. We have the first time after 30 years, European countries previously neutral joining the NATO um, under the pretext of uh, kind of being provided of a certain security. The whole focus of politics is right now on the conflict of Ukraine, whereas we also have to say that there's very few politicians right now on a European level that actually work for peace, which is, which is something we would definitely need. In order to understand all this, though, I have to take you a little bit back in time. Um, the militarization of the European Union um, is a process that has been going on for quite long. Um, 2016, particularly the year of Brexit and the year where Donald Trump was elected president in the US, was marking um, a turn in the strategy of the European Union. It was a time where uh, the European Union started discussing about European autonomy, um, European military capabilities. A year later, PESCO, which is um, the contract, let's say framing um, the possibility of a European army um, with own forces started to, 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 to get hyped. Uh, the whole idea was, uh, yeah, NATO is dying, 
under Trump, um, the whole political agreements we knew are more or less passe. Europe needs to take all, all, uh, care of its own. So we had this exacerbation of the militarization processes aligned, of course, with a very, very racist and a very militarized European border regime. Since Russia's invasion in the Ukraine, um, there has been uh, like the discussion has changed completely. Um, European autonomy is now discussed in complete align and alignment with the NATO and its strategy. I'm actually going to post in the in the chat an analysis of the latest uh, re the latest document, relevant document of the European Union, which is called the Strategic Compass for Europe. This is something you could find originally in the in in the internet sites of the European Union Parliament. It's a, it's a document that is now open to the public. Just to the story of this document, um, Europe started 2016, as I told you, discussing European autonomy, also in military terms. The document then highlighting the strategy of the European Union was called Global Strategy. This document has been updated and the Strategic Compass now published a couple of months ago need to be marked after like republished after the invasion of russia and ukraine um is more or less the the document stepping up this strategy towards militarization and nato alignment so um in the current conjuncture actually asia is not the focus of uh public discussion um you might hear something about nato exercises AUKUS uh was a topic uh, closely but since february this is practically non-existence. And again, the vision is pushed that NATO is a so-called security guarantee and that all the political problems we have right now in the union have a militarized solution. And NATO is, so to say, the promise of that. Um, also, it needs to be mentioned, mostly for fellow listeners from Asia, that um, not only NATO per se, but individually different European countries uh, after the war have pledged to over militarize themselves first and foremost this was the first one in history after the second world war germany uh, pledging 100 billion euros in its um, militarization and uh, military equipment um this was quite shocking i mean politically you have to understand that it means something when all of a sudden germany becomes um the stronger as army again in europe after the second world war and it was a taboo break now um just to give a little bit of future perspective and uh not let you hanging on with a lot of depression um again focusing on the nato asian actions Politically speaking, most of Europeans are not aware of what is going on, and I think therefore we have some space to inform. This is why the event of today is very important also to inform people and again try um, to counteract this pseudo narrative of security, because again, we know that guns are no, no solution for any problem that the world is facing right now. First of all, the most pressing pro problem, which is climate change and um, the environmental degradation we go through with the military is actually pretty much a big one of the biggest reasons we're at the state we are today. But there is some reluctance on the political level uh, addressing the uh, Russian Ukrainian war and including Asia, Asia in the plan. So um, on the political level, again, even within the strategic compass, which is otherwise quite depressing uh, for us in Europe, um, the uh, involvement of the European Union in Asia is not clearly stated, which means that we have a little bit of space to try to mobilize society, try to raise awareness of the military and alliance called NATO, and try to build up a movement that will be able to ultimately re resist um, this kind of future that is promised, which is basically a constant war uh, with death machines that are even unmanned. Uh, so 
Um, you will see, I'm sorry, I'm quite dizzy and I think I'm going to cut it short uh, for this round. Um, you will see this document I've posted in the chat already. Perhaps the people that are responsible of the stream could also share it with you. There are a couple of publications where you could read into uh, the let's say the politics of European militarization, I will take care to uh, share with you all the links. Again, thank you for organizing this today. I hope people uh, from Europe like me are here to learn from you and see how we can find, uh, um, how we can find um, these uh, issues that will help us mobilize Europeans uh, for peace again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin. We feel better soon, get some good rest. We appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us, um, even if you're feeling this way. Um, yeah, and also for focusing a bit on the, you know, the question that, that is raised in the news every day, which is of, of what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, you know, we see a lot of emphasis on Russia's role in that, but not so much on NATO itself, although there's some debate around that. But like you were saying, there's far less, not just in Europe, but also in the U.S., far less focus on what the U.S. is actually doing in the Pacific. Uh, I'd like to turn to Anu Janoy. Uh, to discuss this further. She's also involved in the People's Forum's Peace and Security Cluster. She's also a retired professor and dean of the School of International Studies at uh, Jawaharlal uh, La Nehru University in New Delhi. And Anu, if you could talk to us a bit more about the RIMPAC exercises and NATO's role specifically in the Indo-Pacific and so its implications to peace. Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you and um, thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, what I'm going to speak on is why we in the peace and social movements uh, opposing RIMPAC and in this uh, very uh, transformative world order currently. So there are uh, first a set of uh, geostrategic factors uh, behind a uh, RIMPAC. This year's exercise and the exercises which are going to uh, follow are in the background of this transforming world order where uh, the, you know, the great powers, the powerful countries and their alliances are recalibrating their strategic postures and frameworks. And you can see that from what my previous speakers brilliantly presented in terms of uh, the strategic compass from the EU, the NATO document, which came out um, last evening, the NATO strategic document. Uh, and in the background of this illegal Russian aggression uh, on Ukraine, the, the war, as well as uh, the recalibration and new um, Indo-Pacific regional forum and partnerships like Quad, like the AUKUS, the Five Eyes, were all being uh, revved up. So there is a danger, a clear danger of this war in Ukraine being spilled into the Pacific with such far projections. And the background really is of these far projections, the two uh, very important uh, strategic uh, documents, which uh, if you heard yesterday's meeting, in fact, uh, I would quote a very mainstream person, Malcolm Chalmers, who's the deputy director of the Royal uh, United Services Institute, who said that NATO, and I quote, is back on a Cold War mission. So uh, the RIM pact needs to be uh, seen within this uh, context. Of course, the RIM pact, uh, as we know, and we've just watched Anne's uh, PowerPoint, is the biggest uh, uh, military exercise, but what the NATO and RIMPAC is doing is combining the threats that the US feels and the West feels, which are China and Russia and any power which would not conform to their vision, to their perceptions. And the NATO document um, uh, released yesterday clearly now 
for the first time actually very clearly focuses on the People's Republic of China and it says that this is the main challenge to our interests. So it brings it straight into Asia and the Pacific. And RIMPAC is being used as the medium to send a strong message to China. As you notice that they are excluded, obviously, from this exercise. Since 2018, actually, they've been excluded, but this time, very clearly so, uh, the message is going out to them. Now, the uh, Pacific Rim, really, is where many countries can project their power. So the US can, and so can China, and so can Russia, which is a Pacific power from its ports, and especially Vladivostok. But so can Japan, and Australia, and India, which is an aspirational Indo-Pacific power, not exactly a, a, a power in the Pacific, but um, in the in, in Indian Ocean, yes. But these two have been, these two oceans have now been combined as one. So RIMPAC tries to project a united front of this power uh, projection. But the truth is that many countries which are part of the RIMPAC, like let's say India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Mexico, and Philippines, they have also shown neutrality in this NATO um, proxy war in, in Ukraine. They are opposed to these uh, NATO wars. They have repeatedly op uh, opposed them. Uh, they do not want to engage in the competition uh, between the US and the China, which is a focus uh, of uh, the new strategic order. And they do not even really want to take sides. Uh, and they are uh, showing signs of strategic neutrality. Further, many of them have benefited from both or either Russia and China in their own development goals. And they want to focus on their own regimes and uh, stability and development. And several of them, for example, even India, uh, especially, but also Indonesia and Malaysia have close bilateral strategic relations with Russia. So they have different intent, uh, intentions. Of course, um, many of the countries in RIMPAC and in the Asia Pacific have different interests and some countries in the region have unresolved issues with China, for example, India, but they're on a path of bilateral resolutions and do not want pressure from NATO or, or uh, other militarist alliances. Similarly, Vietnam has differences with uh, China Philippines with a dispute on the Spratly Islands, where in 2016, the arbitral tribunal uh, ruled in favor of the Philippines, but China rejected, uh, rejected that. And recently, for example, China imposed a three-month mor um, moratorium on fishing uh, in the South China Seas. And both uh, Philippines and Vietnam and US argued that this is a violation of international law. But how do we want to resolve this? That is the main question. Not through these militarist alliances and militarization, but diplomacy, negotiation, talk, talk, and more talk. Further, um, you know, world trade. 80% of world trade goes through the seas, of which 60% goes through the Indo-Pacific. Um, and Everyone wants to sit, secure these marine lines, trade lines, but these have to be done collectively and not competitively. Uh, so NATO really is further aggravating and militarizing the Indo-Pacific, uh, Indo -Pacific, and some Chinese scholars are actually now arguing for the first time that they are using or going to be using Taiwan as a proxy, just as they did Ukraine. And this confrontation is possible near these very precious resources of, of uh, the Pacific uh, Islands, which we just saw on uh, Anne's map. Then besides these strategic factors, there are the ecological and climate factors. The UN Secretary General just called uh, the oceans an emergency issue and has called for turning uh, the because wars and military exercises are all extremely major polluters. 
And uh, there is a movement towards a nuclear free and independent Pacific uh, in which uh, the Solomon Islands, the presidents of Samoa, the Fiji and others have called for a nuclear free Pacific zone that evident in the Treaty of Rarotonga. And New Zealand and joined the nine uh, forum islands to ratify the TPNW, but I don't know its fate now, especially of New Zealand, which is now uh, rearing to go with uh, NATO uh, as an, a major ally. And lastly, there are the people's factors. People of the specific rim are opposed to rim pack and these military exercises because it leads to a cycle of militarization retribution and conflict e escalation and uh, people are talking for the need of diplomacy and common security and Raina will speak later of it and there is there is a search for common security not the kind of exclusive security being promoted uh, by NATO and and these alliances so what do we need to do really is we need to keep a constant watch inform people and develop our own uh, analysis of these strategic moves that incorporate voices from the global south work with small states which have no voices in international politics i think the eu is particularly important even despite their militarization and they can convince the us to at least de-escalate to some extent and shift to diplomacy and the people's movement need to put pressure on all this. Uh, so um, really, uh, uh, the, the global South gets caught in this escalation and de-escalation on interests which are not their own. And therefore, we are calling for stop NATO in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anu. Um, next, I would be calling on Walton Bellow, who actually campaigned recently on a progressive vision in the Philippines. However, he's not with us today. Um, there are protests happening in Manila uh, as we speak. It's also the inauguration day, and uh, Walton Bellow himself actually contested as the vice presidential candidate in the Philippines for Laban and Basa Party. And he's actually faced sedition charges and all kinds of issues for the progressive vision that he and his party were promoting. Unfortunately, he's not with us today, but hopefully um, he will be able to join us um, in the future. So I'm going to turn to Reiner Braun from the International Peace Bureau and International No to NATO, No to War Network. Uh, he's also been involved in the counter demonstrations in Spain. And uh, I'd uh, like to ask Rainer if you can expand on what Anu was discussing regarding common security, diplomacy, and ways forward, given the, the context that so many of the speakers have laid out. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. And after these distinguished speakers to speak about NATO is not so easy, but maybe I'm the only one who read up to now the new NATO strategic concept, 22, which was published yesterday. And this document has some interesting points for our work. First of all, the word China is not mentioned in the document. There is no word about China and about NATO-China relations. Second, there's only a very short description, less than half a page, six lines, about the Indo-Pacific activities of NATO. And they only mention that they are guaranteed the security interest and the ship freedom in this region. Nothing else is mentioned. That is, for me, an interesting point. And it shows for me a little bit a controversy which we also have in NATO. The controversy is how much is NATO focusing on Russia and the Russian conflict, or how much is NATO focusing on the global, the global alliance. The US is pushing for the global alliance with a lot of power, but above all, the East Europeans, from Poland or Czech Republic to the Baltic countries, 
want to keep the priority of the European or North Atlantic area. This means uh, that they have to be a little bit careful by the enlarging process to Asia. And what they have decided only to say two points is to enlarge the quick responsible troops from, from 40,000 to 300,000. So we will have now at the end of the year, the beginning of the next year, 300,000 soldiers along the border to Russia, which are controlling this border and open for any provocation. The second is the US announced yesterday, Biden, that they will have a new military headquarter in Poland. This is absolutely the end of the Russian NATO agreement because this says very clearly permanent destination of troops and military equipment in the East European countries is not allowed. This new military headquarter is for me also the first step for putting nuclear weapons to Poland as a reaction to uh, the behavior of Russia. So that is a little bit the new situation, which is very, very dangerous and shows for me that, Anu, you quote the Cold War in the beginning. From my understanding, we are not at the beginning of the Cold War. We are in the middle of a Cold War. And we really should accept that this Cold War is even more horrible, more dangerous when we are looking to the weapon systems, when we are looking to the uncontrolled behavior of politicians and military, even more dangerous than the first Cold War in the 50s and 60s. That is the reality. So, and then comes the question, everyone raised first point why this happened, and then the second point, are there alternatives? I think Anu was brilliant explaining why it happened. We have this fight of a new world order between the pow powers which are strong and the powers which become weaker. And under capitalistic conditions, this fight is not peaceful. The US want to keep their dominant position in the world is uh, much weaker than 20 years ago. And uprising countries above all, like China, but also India, want to get more influence and more part of the world order. So this fight is also done in as a proxy war in Ukraine, but you can also continue other wars where you can see that these forces are fighting against each other. So what is the alternative for, pe for peace loving people? I think for me, the alternative is to say, we have to come back to a system of common security. Then comes the first argument, oh, common security, this is the old European dream. Yes, it is European, but it is not any longer European. It's a worldwide concept for cooperation, dialogue, negotiations, for developing common security projects in the different parts of the world. The big advantage and the development of the new Olaf Palmer report from April is that we are saying common security is always a regional effort for every part of the world. So we need common security strategies, definitely for Korean Pennsylvania. We need this for the South China Sea. We need this for the conflict between India and Pakistan. This must be developed on the background of the theories and main points, which were Olaf Palmer mentioned in this report 82 and which we renewed in the new Olaf primary 22. So that is the key challenge. And the second point for me is we need the cooperation of the peace movements. I'm very happy that we could say today that we have this peace wave around the world, along the NATO summit. The peace wave with two hours presentation of all parts of the world was for me or is for me a very positive first sign for common international coordinating actions of the international peace movement. And I think we definitely should continue this on the different fields. And these peace wave is a very much creative actions organized by grassroots and by other organizations is really a great sign that people, many of our activists are willing to come to these more coordinating activities. Coordinating activities means also for me that we have to discuss about the common security worldwide, that we have to develop clearer and regional strategies for this. And my maybe final point is that we again have to put the question of disarmament much more in the middle point of our activities. Katharina was mentioned Germany. Can you imagine Germany is now the third biggest military spender? We are spending now between 70 and 80 billion, jumping up from 50 to 80 billion in less than two years. 
It is amazing. The European Union countries are raising their military budget between five and seven percent. I have not to tell you about the US. We have the military race in Asia. So we need a discussion about military disarmament. Otherwise, we will not solve the global problems of human being above all the climate problems. On one side, because we need the money for the civil societies and the development. On the other side, can any one of you imagine that we solve the global problems under the atmosphere of confrontation and war? where the people are, where the kind of governments are fighting against each other, where we have rockets at all borders, and where we have this military engagement. So cooperation is also a key point for solving the global problems. So to say, back to the Olaf Palme report, we need the cooperation because we need such a kind of relations in the international level to solve the global problems above all the environmental problems. The key problem is climate change and new the whole question of food and food security. And so my point of view is let's us unite our forces. We had a good start point with Madrid with the demonstration and the peace wave, but we need much more common efforts and common actions of the international peace movement and other social movements for developing a new atmosphere of cooperation and pressure our governments to go in this direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rainer. Um, I think these are critical questions that you're raising, especially considering uh, the question of disarmament, as well as putting resources, the world's resources, financial and otherwise, towards actually meeting human needs of the time and uh, for development, for dealing with social inequality, and for dealing with the, the climate transition that's, that's necessary. Um, I think uh, this has been extraordinarily helpful kind of discussing um, in terms of policies, uh, how, how the peace movement, how activist organizations and people's networks are talking about the common security and diplomacy and the importance of focusing on dialogue uh, and, and coming up with new ways of, of making decisions in the 21st century that are peaceful and sustainable. Um, now I'd like to turn to a people's voice from Guam. This is uh, Monica Flores, and she is um, from an organization called Putehi Litexan, uh, Save Retidian. And of course, I think everyone here will know that Guam is currently a territory of the U.S. It's had a long history of colonization, and even to this day, the people do not democratic representation. Um, and so uh, Monica is also involved with the Pacific Peace Network. Um, and if you uh, can give us your perspective from the Pacific about, um, about the, the RIMPAC and how it affects the lives of the people in Guam and also the, the role of the U.S. and lack of democratic uh, engagement, and also, if you can talk to us a little bit about the cancel impact statement, uh, which has been dropped into the comments uh, section. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you so much, Tabitha, and to all the organizers, half a day, everyone. My name is Monica Flores, and I'm a member of Tahi Latex and Save Retidian, and we're a community-based group in Guahan. And I'm a descendant of the indigenous Chamo people who lived in the Marianas Islands, or Lagos Zangani, for over 3,500 years. And as an oceanic civilization of over 3,500 years, we've cultivated a sacred relationship to the ocean. Um, and we're also in a period of revitalization. So when I see you know, uh, Sina Ann's images of, of uh, what RIMPAC does in the Pacific. You know, when we learn about the um, imperialist violence happening in our sacred ocean, um, it's it's quite uh, frustrating. And, and we are just, you know, one community in the Pacific that has a sacred relationship with the, with the ocean. Um, and we are also one of the oldest colonies in the Pacific, and we understand how, how vulnerable our waters, our lands, and sacred sites are. We have a very long history of envir environmental racism resulting from colonization and militarization, and the indigenous Chamorro people of Guahan and the Marianas uh, 
as well as uh, other islanders around the Pacific, we continue to suffer several ongoing indigenous and human rights violations at the hands of you know, the US military and government. And we're fighting several injustices here at home that impact our life ways, our sovereignty, and all future generations. And of course, it's, sorry, just one second. It's fun. I just noticed I, I had to turn my power on. It's uh, fundamentally impossible for us as Pacific people to separate ourselves from the ocean. And it's really through our ancestry, our life ways, our songs, stories, and art, uh, our, our ways of living um, that, you know, you can see we're deeply connected, interconnected to the ocean. And so um, we are a direct action group in Guam. And we're, we are we really want to work for the protection of culturally significant uh, resources and sacred sites and for the return of ancestral land to the indigenous families who lost their land. And we stand in solidarity with many groups in the Pacific who want peace in our homelands. And, um, you know, just last week, I, I don't know if some of you saw, um, there were a lot of us here in Guam uh, were uh, made uh, aware of a lot of military news reports um, sort of discussing missile threats to Guam. And this is something that has happened previously. And, and this is a really dangerous rhetoric that's used to, um, to continue, you know, um, this violence that happens. Uh, we heard it's in the, it's an Air Force magazine. It's in a few other um, news sources that, um, that uh, all these military folks are talking about now there's all these threats uh, to Guam and that China even might want to use Guam as a, as a base as well. And so we've had World War II here at home. And so again, we're feeling like, um, you know, the tip of the spear, as Dr. Maget Bavako put it in the peace wave the other day, uh, the tip of the spear, the, you know, the, the front defensive end uh, for the United States um, in the United States imperialism in the Pacific, right? And the, the spear breaks first, the spear is bloodied first, uh, the tip of the spear is in battle. And so that it, that's, this is how we feel. Um, and then, you know, thinking of all of the other folks in the Pacific who, who really tie our ancestry to the ocean, um, it's, 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 it's really devastating, all of the environmental harm, all of the, de the desecration truly that's happening in our homelands um, and in our ocean. And, um, our, our main source of drinking water, our Northern Lens Aquifer, is extremely vulnerable to the increased military presence here in Guam with the construction of the new um, live fire training range complex, as well as the new Marine base um, in anticipation of the relocation of Marines from Okinawa to Guam. Um, and again, you know, the military has been speaking about these new missile threats and, and emphasizing that Guam really needs to amp up its infrastructure and hurry up and amp, and amp up military infrastructure here. It's really to protect the US military investments in Guam. It's not necessarily to protect the lives, the people and the land here. Um, aside from this, the military plans to um, conduct open burning over our Northern Lens Aquifer and we're engaged in a lawsuit um, with the against the Air Force to try to stop it, but um, open burning and open detonation as well as all of these other harmful practices are taking place over our Northern Lens Aquifer. And I just wanted to show a uh, real quick, uh, a picture, an image of the Northern part of Guam. Right now the military occupies about 30% of the island. And you can see here, um, these are the, the, this is the live fire training range complex. This is the new Marine base. And all of this is Anderson Air Force Base at the North of Guam. And that's really, you know, the investment that uh, the, the missile defense system is here to protect, right? Um, we just saw earlier this month Valiant Shield, which also brought um, uh, strikers uh, from the carriers, um, Abraham Lincoln and the USS Ronald Reagan. We also saw the, um, the BRP uh, from the Philippines dock here. We saw several other cruisers. Um, there were some we weapons uh, ex drops exercises here. And this is all right before RIMPAC. This is all in anticipation of RIMPAC. Valiant Shield usually takes place around the time of RIMPAC as well. And so thousands of, uh, of troops come he through here. Um, we see a lot of the a lot of the heavy machinery moves through here and you, the communities of Guahan and Hawaii always have increase in crime as well uh, whenever these deployments take place in our community. Um, so the violence is quite far reaching. It's not just out, it's, it's out in the ocean, it's destroying our, our, import, our sacred resource, but it's also um, impacting our communities very directly. Um, I, I also thought I should mention, uh, well here, um, what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm going to go ahead and share um, 
the Council of Impact 2022 joint statement. Um, it's also in the petition. So um, the link, Anne shared the link earlier and you can sign the petition and share it. Um, but here's the call to cancel RIMPAC and build a Pacific zone of peace. The Pacific Peace Network and its allied organizations call for the cancellation of the dangerous, provocative, and destructive international RIM of the Pacific, RIMPAC, naval war practice, and for increased citizen pressure for a demilitarized pan-Pacific zone of peace. RIMPAC naval war practice, the largest naval war maneuvers in the world, will take place off Hawaii and the west coast of the US from June 29th through August 4th, 2022. At RIMPAC 2022, over 25,000 military personnel, 38 ships, 170 aircraft, four submarines, excuse me, from 26 countries, will practice war simulations, engaging enemy forces. RIMPAC, coupled with expanding US military capability in Hawaii, Australia, Guahan, and other Pacific nations, increases the likelihood of armed conflict between the United States and China, either by design or accident, with unthinkable consequences for the peoples of Asia, the Pacific, and the world. Please endorse this call to action. Pacific Peace Network will share this petition and call on legislators of each participating country to cancel RIMPAC. RIMPAC dramatically contributes to the destruction of the ecology and aggravation of the climate crisis in the Pacific region. RIMPAC war forces will blow up decommissioned ships with missiles endangering marine mammals such as humpback whales, dolphins, and Hawaiian monk seals, and polluting the ocean with contaminants from vessels. Land forces will conduct ground assaults that will tear up beaches where green sea, green sea turtles come to breed. We reject the massive expenditure of funds on war making when humanity is suffering from lack of food, water, and other life-sustaining elements. Human security is not based on military war drills, but on care for this planet and its inhabitants. 2022 RIMPAC includes military forces from Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Denmark, Ecuador, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Israel, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Netherlands, New Zealand, Peru, the Republic of Korea, the Republic of the Philippines, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Tonga, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Eight of the 26 RIMPAC participating countries are members of NATO. Canada, Colombia, Denmark, France, Germany, Italy, the UK, and the US, while four are partners of NATO. This means 45% of RIMPAC participants have NATO ties, demonstrating that NATO is becoming a Pacific military force. The Pacific peace members currently come from countries across the Pacific, including Guahan, Jeju Island, South Korea, Okinawa, Japan, the Philippines, the Northern Marianas Islands, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, Hawaii, and the United States. So please join us in this call for action and sign on to um, this petition. Um, today is also uh, the deadline for a call for um, submissions for um, an online art exhibit, the Cancel RIMPAC online art exhibit. Um, and I will share that also in the chat so that, um, you know, we invite folks to submit to this uh, digital um, online art exhibit, which is being hosted by um, our friends at Young Sawara Pacific. And uh, I'm, it's an honor to stand in solidarity with all of you for, for peace and genuine security. Um, thank you so much, Sina Masi. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, thanks for sharing the uh, Council of Impact statement details with us. And we encourage everyone here to take a moment to just post it on your social media platforms and share it with others. Um, we, we have to cancel with impact. We have to say no to NATO as well. Um, one of the things that Monica talked about is the sacred, sacred relationship of her community with the ocean for, for many, many, many generations. And I think that kind of ethic is the kind of ethic that's going to get us out of this crisis to recognize our relationships with one another and with our environment. Uh, she spoke a bit about the um, ecological destruction of the U.S. military in Guam. Uh, and Anne mentioned earlier that there are 800 military bases, U.S. military bases around the world today. Every single one of them is involved in these kinds of practices. They're not only, you know, creating problems when they do engage in 
warfare in various areas, but they're also just in, just in terms of the way they maintain their base infrastructure, it's completely unsustainable and uh, devastates the local communities and ecosystems uh, where they're located, not to mention are completely uh, undemocratic in the way they function. Um, now I'd like to move toward um, playing the uh, collective poem by 13 Indigenous uh, peoples from Oceania. And I think uh, Nina is going to screen that for us here. Um, I Yes, I am screening it right now. Please let me know if you cannot hear something. In a world without this pack, a couple will put their sounds smiling through the pain of birth. No longer afraid of losing her child to bombs. She will breathe. We will breathe. Yeah. In a world without this pack, there is breath enough to stand against the torpedo and team the amphibious assaults, underwater explosions, the nuclear bombs and billions of dollars and bullets of peacetime that continue elsewhere. Breath enough to solve these and so many wounds, to sing so loud we drown all submarine sonar. In a world without war games on our watery plate body, there is no place for hungry egos, no place for triggering weapons into the valley of the rich, vast, blue wonder. She will breathe. Free, free, free them, chanting. My body is not your permanent. In a world without militarization, words like colonization, domination, become words used in the past tense. The possibilities of merge are great. Islands as space for creating growth and true security. Tides, ocean, and a thing to breathe. In a world without nuclear warfare, Tahitian, Marshallese, Hawaiian, indigenous lives would be celebrated without hierarchy based on dollars and euros. Without fear for our smallness or isolation, the protection of empire, unfurling, a pandemic, of radiation, contamination, and sickness, all lives will be created equal. In a world without deception, no one will face the insecurities of people. In a world without naval sonar, a song returns assembly of Cerulean gods to an altar of coral and island anchored to this new course from the depths of obscurity on a low outlet but to do this level from which we all do our living. The source is stable. Four. Two. In a world without appropriation, our language will be unstolen. Te mana, te kaha, rest from the crest of Her Majesty New Zealand ships of war. In a world without naval frigates, Eva traverses the royal Wamanu, a star command blue sky merging into the navy blue Pacific. Kiwa fishes for islands across the ultramarine hauling up Hawaii necessary despite. In a world without war, we wouldn't have to wonder if these weights of bombs being dropped on our villages, if our question if our hana was clean on the street, our bloodline seeking us to No trespassing signs and fence lines wouldn't dictate the journeys of our tano and our pots. We think islanders connecting through the constellations of the moon, competing with our coconut trees to share origin stories in a world without bombs, we honor generations of people. We see forests of poor. We stand in the bottom of our sacred mountains. We plant our yede in the frigid waters. We stare back at icons. We see our reflections. 
and are fed in a world without bombs rise from the sea and try to conquer if In a world without militancy, the breath is like a wound. Finally, Thank you. That was really powerful. I think when we listen again from our own computers, the sound quality will probably be much better and easier, but I felt like the captions were also very helpful. Um, it's a bit tricky streaming, but it's, it was, I think we, we got the message that this was about what a world without war games would look like. Um, and, and it's uh, beautiful to imagine things like colonization and occupation existing only in the past tense. Uh, and, and, and finally, uh, what really resonated with me was the point that no one believes security is a function of bullets. And I think all of you, all of the speakers kind of made that point in their own ways that there's nothing secure about militarizing the world that's, that's not going to provide any sense of longevity uh, for the vast majority of the global population. Um, so now we are coming to the final portion of the webinar. Um, anyone is welcome to drop some questions and answers in the Q&A box. We have received a few. Um, and what I think would be best to do is to just give every speaker a chance to make their final remarks um, in, in maybe three to four minutes each. And you can see um, there was one question regarding, you know, wanting to know more about the no to NATO demonstrations in Madrid. Um, and yes, uh, I just see your comment in the chat, Teresa. So I, I'm looking to your questions right now. Um, her earlier question was also regarding how the movement sees Biden's announcement for more military force in Poland. Uh, so if anyone wants to answer those questions in giving their, uh, their final remarks, um, they can do so. So maybe we could uh, go in reverse order this time. Um, if, if that's okay, or if anyone would like to just jump in and go first, that's also fine. I'll go first. Okay, yeah. So we'll go in order. Yes, okay. please. Well, it's uh, it's really been powerful to hear all of the statements from all of our presenters and uh, the details that we have about uh, what uh, RIMPAC is all about, the destructive force of it at RIMPAC, and how all the 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 leadership of 26 countries have said this is really important that we have to spend our money to go out and and uh, practice uh, destruction and as this shirt says war destroys our humanity and we've certainly seen what's happened in Ukraine and Russia uh, that we must be pushing so hard to stop organizations like NATO and our our individual countries, the United States, which is one of the biggest warmongers uh, in the world, we've got to collectively as uh, human beings say no to war and stop this NATO stuff. Thank you. James, Tim, and you guys do have a bit more time for your closing remarks if needed, but we can, we can do a few rounds um, if, if we have time. I, I think there are some questions uh, people have raised uh, and Francine had raised her hand. So if they can ask questions and we can answer them quickly before our closing remarks. Okay. There's one question that has appeared here uh, as well as the two I, uh, I raised earlier, Teresa's question. Uh, this is by Kuhin 
and he asks, are people in the EU feeling the effects of tax money being diverted to weapons and war the way we feel it in the US? You know, maybe I've started answering it, others can add. Uh, we have in Europe very ambivalent feeling to the, at these times. On one side, we have this huge propaganda about the war of Russia against Ukraine, which said we must defend ourselves. For this, we need more money. This is from the media from day to night in all talk shows end and end. And on the other side, people start seeing and feeling the consequences of this war. The prices are rising, the inflation is rising. It is not any longer possible to pay the gas price and an end. So we will see in the autumn if more people are really willing to go to, to protest against these politics. And our job, I think, as peace activists is to bring together the social question and the peace question disarmament and butter. This is the question, all butter and war is not any longer possible. So uh, we have, this is very ambivalent today and as peace movement, we are not in such a strong position. We have to say this very clear under this illegal attack from Russia against Ukraine. This makes life for us not easier, but I think we are doing our best and the way is to convince and to see what are the consequences of this war. And I'm quite sure that we will have bigger protests in the autumn when the people in the different countries see what are the consequences of the war, consequences of the sanctions, consequences of all the behavior of our government. Let me answer shortly to Poland. The new military headquarters will be established in Poland. It should be opened at the end of the year. It's a control headquarter and headquarter for uh, the for organizing the whole US and NATO army in the whole east part of Europe, including the Baltic states, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, and Czech Republic and Slovakia. And this is definitely against the Russian NATO charter and this is a new step of escalation. And final question was, you know, Anne was saying this, I think we were about 30,000 people in Madrid on the streets. This was a very impressive demonstration with a very nice Spanish or Southern feeling. So we enjoyed it all very much. And it shows what is possible when the peace movement united goes on the street. So it is really a very optimistic sign which was coming out from, from Madrid. Thank you, Rainer. And Katarina, I saw your hand go up. Um, I'm after your remarks, uh, Francine has also raised her hand to take your question. Thank you. Um, so to the question now that was posted in the Q&A section, uh, do Europeans um, consider that their tax money are going to war? Yes, they do, but they also don't know. I mean, you have to understand, I think it was not mentioned also until now, that uh, the war in Ukraine really affects immediately the lives of Europeans. You know, inflation is going up. Um, there is a whole discussion uh, around the fossil fuel dependencies and so on. For example, the country I am based in, Austria, has an 80% gas dependency on Russia, which means uh, that right now, uh, you know, with all this uh, autonomizing with, from Russia, aligning with the US uh, strategy going on, everything is getting very, very expensive. So even if they don't realize how much of their tax money is uh, going into militarization, they do understand that this war affects their everyday lives. And this is important to understand because this gives also um, an opportunity to peace activists to transfer the message into social movements into the working, uh, um, the organized labor also, and make people understand that wars do not serve the interests and the security interests in particular of working class people in the continent. So um, although it's quite sad that not many people realize um, the, the amount of, uh, of money going into militarization processes, the current situation opens a window where we could start uh, reapproaching social and labor movements and uh, make them allies 
in the struggle against war. That's the first point I wanted to make. I put already in the chat um, a very useful tool um, organized by uh, TNI and um, and State Watch, two NGOs here in Europe that actually helps people in the civic society calculate EU budgets. Perhaps this is something you you uh, over there in Asia would like to take a look at because I think it will provide you with some um, information, but it's a great tool in general to speak to the civic society. And I want to make a point that I forgot to make uh, uh, before uh, when I was speaking. I mean, this 100 billion uh, military budget of Germany. I mean, it, it's it's not about Germany, but it's about the dimension. One has to compare it, uh, for example, with the money that the uh, um, that the COP uh, has been attributing to um, nations that are uh, immediately challenged by climate change, like the reparation budget of the UN for nations that are. Uh, right now really suffering through climate change is all in loan 100 billion, which means the Western countries, the strongest economies are only willing to attribute so little to battle climate change and also pay reparations for climate change. The amount is equal to the amount of militarization of Germany, just one state. So if you understand this dimension, even if you are not call, uh, called to pay in, even if you're not living in Europe, you understand there is there's ultimately something very flawed on how we understand security of everyday people. And I think the lesson, the message we have to spread right now is that if we want to live on a planet that has a future that is livable, worth living and we all want to be safe on it then we can only be, be safe if everyone is safe and for everyone to be safe we need to deal with nato we need to dismantle nato we need to fight militarization in any context and be able to persuade the leading class that we need to divert funds from weapons and destruction machines to actual infrastructural investments that will make everyone live a better life. I think that's the game right now. Thank you so much, Katarina. And we might come back to this question of, of reparations and also you hinted at it a few other stuff as well, like uh, the question of racialization. Um, I want to take Francine's question, and then we might uh, go to an, another point made in the chat uh, by Teresa, which links to that question of racialization as well. Um, uh, Francine, are you able to turn your uh, mic on? Let's having some trouble with the mic. So, I think so. would Hi. Like, okay, there's yep. <laughs> Hello, hello. I did not have any question. I don't know where this comes from. I'm very sorry. Okay, you raised your hand. That's fine. Then um, if anyone would like to build on uh, the points that were just raised or would like to directly respond to the, to the points that Teresa made in the chat in which she says, mass movement building must be a key, must be a key component of the resistance strategy. 
the Poor People's Campaign in the U.S. brings diversity, equity, and uh, troubles from the chat. Diversity, equity, and inclusion to an otherwise overwhelmingly white-led peace movement in the U.S. Anyone want to uh, comment on that? Yes, and uh, thank you to Teresa for uh, uh, bringing up that we certainly have to have a the greatest diverse group of people challenging NATO that we possibly can. Uh, certainly in uh, the, the Pacific, we have plenty of diversity. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in the United States, of course, we must work harder to uh, diversify uh, the the movements that we have there there are a lot of there are a lot of movements that's for sure but making sure that each one of them recognizes uh the struggles of of the other and helps out wherever they can and uh the poor people's campaign uh that we had just a week ago in washington dc uh, um, march and rally and that was the culmination of two years of work of people all throughout the United States that were having uh, conferences and symposia about the issues of uh, using so much of our monies in each of our countries for war, rather than on the social issues of health, education, uh, and you know, taking care of people rather than killing them. Thank you, Teresa, for bringing that up. It must be much more diverse than what we have. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anne. Would anyone else like to jump in? I thought that the session was going until 45 after, and I see a message from Cora saying it actually ends roughly around now, but I want to give everyone a chance to give their final remarks. Um, so maybe we could take um, two minutes each for those who didn't uh, weigh in on the questions and then uh, give Sean a chance to sum up uh, before we close the session. Um, Anne, uh, Anu, would you like to give your concluding remarks? Yeah, I think um, to make the peace movement into a mass movement, uh, what's happening is I think people do connect um, issues of war, uh, but issues of war are linked to social security, to environment, et cetera. But what happens then is that the hegemonic discourses come in and convince them that it is the fault of the other. For example, you can see the amount of legitimacy that uh, no to negotiations with Russia are currently there world over. The belief that we have to <clears throat> only have peace from a position of strength. So we need to put our message there um, you know, of countering this. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Anu. And uh, Katarina also talked basically of solidarity. You know, two points. First of all, Yes, we need a much bigger and much more diverse peace movement, but have in mind peace movements are not created at the green table. They are coming up when people feel that they should be engaged and then and they could be mobilized. And that is the key point of our work, which we have to do for the next weeks and months. And then hopefully we can see in the autumn that we have a much, much more actions of the peace movement around the world. And we need much more activities and actions in the United States as a key war monster, but also in Europe. And <clears throat> for me, this webinar and the Peace Wave is a good start point for bringing more solidarity in the different peace movements, connect ourselves with the actions. And I think we should continue on this way. I think this is the way of success for enlarging our movement and for being, again, a political factor in our society. Thank you so much, Brian. 
And I see that our speaker, I know he was busy today with, um, so welcome, Walden. We are actually closing the session right now, but we wanted to give you a chance, give you a few minutes uh, to weigh in here before we close the session. So welcome, the floor is over to you. Sorry, was it was it me you were asking? Hello. Yes, uh, Walden, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Now I can hear you. So basically, we were just we we're just getting ready to close the session, but we did want to give you a chance to weigh in for a few minutes before we end. If if it would be possible. Um, I know you, you had some other things, other commitments, but if you could just give us just three or four minutes of insight from your perspective on NATO impact and the way forward. We're really focusing on the way forward now because we're moving toward the, the closing. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, first of all, um, I'm really sorry that, but I was late. Uh, but I had told Kong that I was in this other meeting. It was, uh, I had to meet with my lawyers because the, um, the vice president of the Philippines is suing me for libel. And uh, I think that uh, that was important to make sure that we had a good defense there. Um, uh, well, um, just a number of points that I would just like to make. Uh, one is, um, um, of course, it's a very, very dangerous trend uh, that is at work now, which is to uh, extend uh, NATO's uh, presence uh, in the Western Pacific. And um, as we all know, um, we have the NATO meeting that is going on to which um, uh, South Korea and Japan have been uh, invited to attend, and this has already triggered a, a very, very um, um, important but measured uh, response from Beijing. Uh, that um, you know that this is a very provocative move. Uh, well, I think that. Um, we are probably seeing a situation whereby the United States um, under Biden has uh, pretty much um, uh, uh, been in the footsteps of Donald Trump uh, in terms of uh, extending Trump's uh, economic warfare or trade war um, on China and um, making it even more of uh, a, a total containment, uh, meaning uh, um, military containment. And uh, so I, I think that this is, you know, this is really very uh, uh, disturbing. The one thing uh, domestically uh, or the one thing that unites uh, the Democrats and the Republicans uh, in the United States at this point, excluding, of course, the uh, left wing of the Democratic Party, uh, is you know the containment of China. So uh, I think we must realize that um, uh, there are domestic dynamics. Uh, um, in terms of the expansion of NATO uh, at the behest of the United States uh, to the Western Pacific, that we must also look at the domestic dynamics here, uh, because this is really an effort uh, by the Democrats under Biden uh, to see if you know there is you know a way by which um, uh, you know they by militaris, militarizing uh, the, um, the um, containment of China, uh, they sort of uh, feel that they can you know, cut off the Republican inroads uh, into the electorate uh, in the United States at this point. So um, definitely we must look at 
the fact that there is a domestic dimension uh, in terms of the uh, United States uh, increasing um, um, military containment of uh, China. Uh, just a, a number of other uh, points that I, I would just like to raise at this point. Uh, my sense is um, the, the push by the United States to make the conflict with China increasingly a military one. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, this is something that was more or less inevitable from my point of view, uh, because um, the China has pretty much uh, overtaken the United States uh, when it comes to the economic dimension. Uh, we are really talking about uh, a situation whereby the um, central motor uh, of the global economy, uh, despite COVID-19, uh, is China. And we are talking about China being now responsible for about 28% uh, uh, of global GDP, you know, that is that the rise in global GDP, uh, that uh, China uh, uh, is responsible for about 28% of that. And uh, the United States uh, is only responsible for half of that. Um, there are some estimates at this point in time that China uh, uh, pretty much is now, if you calculate according to purchasing power uh, parity, um, that China now is the world's uh, biggest economy. So um, um, making, militarizing the conflict with China uh, uh, fairly aggressively, uh, I think is one way that uh, the United States as a declining superpower um, on many other dimensions uh, is trying to regain some ground and that it is only in this area where the United States has absolute, uh, and not only relative, uh, uh, I mean, and both absolute and relative superiority uh, over China, because indeed uh, China has not really focused on, um, you know, fo on, on strengthening its military relative to the United States um, over the last few decades, and not even in the last few years. Uh, the focus has been pretty much the economy, uh, as well, you know, as building up global trade links uh, and investment links with the global south. Uh, so um, the, if you look at the balance of military power between the United States and China, there's no way that China can compare at this point in time. Uh, the United States spent three times more than China uh, when it comes to uh, the military budget, uh, about 750 billion pesos, I mean dollars to about 200, 250 billion on the, in the part of China. Uh, the quality of US weaponry is in fact, you know, far superior. Uh, and you can just see the fact that in terms of offensive capability, which is aircraft carriers, uh, China has about three aircraft carriers with, you know, uh, um, a 1970s Soviet design, uh, whereas the United States uh, has the, um, you know, the state of the art, like the USS Gerald Ford. Uh, and and the, the other thing is we must realize that uh, the last time China was engaged in conflict was, I believe, in the late 70s, uh, when its troops marched into uh, Vietnam. Uh, whereas the United States has been constantly at war uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 years, only in ending with Afghanistan. I think what this means is, you know, that as a war machine, the United States is extremely well honed because it has practice in warfare. Uh, and as we all know, preparing for war is different from waging war, as um, Clausewitz says. So 
uh, this ability to wage war, uh, the United States is, you know, uh, lightning years away from China. And this is really what scares Xi Jinping, which is why he keeps on reminding the military that by 2049, the military must be able to fight a war that it can win. Uh, and a number of uh, experts on China feel that, uh, you know, this is sort of um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping's way of reminding uh, the Chinese military that it is far behind the United States. Uh, but I think, on the other hand, I don't think that there is any attempt to prioritize, uh, you know, military uh, spending uh, when it comes to the priorities of China. So um, let me just say here that um, uh, uh, we are entering a very or a very dangerous situation at this point. Uh, I think the United States hell bent on uh, isolating China. Um, my sense is that this has not only um, uh, military uh, roots in the military, but it has to do with the increasing um, rise of China uh, economically um, and the United States feeling that the only way that this can be uh, contained, China can be contained is uh, via um, the, um, uh, is uh, by military means. So let me just, um, um, end there at this point in time, uh, or say that the um, uh, war in the Ukraine, uh, of course, it is very unjustifiable. Uh, China, uh, you know, Russia must really um, uh, stop the invasion. But my point is that the United States and um, and NATO uh, have taken advantage, uh, you know, of uh, Putin's war. Uh, in order to uh, be able to build up their military forces and their strategy involving the expansion of, of NATO into the Pacific. So I think this, this is the situation at this point in time. And um, I, I am uh, um, uh, very happy to be with you. I'm glad that I was able to make it. And uh, let us continue this cooperation uh, as we enter into a very dangerous uh, period. Thank you very much. So much for joining us, Golden Darlow, and for offering your insight uh, on this um, uh, effort by the US military to use force to try to contain uh, China's economic growth. Um, I want to now turn to Sean Connor from the International Peace Bureau to uh, sum up and uh, then we will wrap up the session and start. Thank you, uh, Tavi. And uh, I have to say this is, this is uh, quite a lot of information to sum up, uh, but I'm going to try to keep it nice and short here. Uh, since we are a little bit over time already, and I don't want to keep anyone too long. Uh, but thank you to all the excellent panelists for really uh, a lot of information. I have about five pages of notes here uh, from the meeting today, uh, just trying to keep up with everything. But really, uh, it was great. Uh, so I will say, uh, as kind of the first point for the sum up, uh, we are at a point in history uh, where we're facing multiple forces uh, that are battling for what the future world order will be whether we stay on the path that we have since the end of the Cold War, a US and its allies, NATO dominated uh, world policy or world order uh, and challenges that are arising from uh, China, of course, uh, as well as Russia uh, and maybe perhaps also uh, some of the global South to some degree or another. Uh, and of course, us as a peace movement, of course, looking for our own uh, world order that prioritizes peace. Uh, so we have on one hand, the NATO alliance, which at this moment is increasing in size and 
vastly increasing its military resources through uh, huge growths in the budgets of many countries. Uh, we see on the European level, as well as Katarina outlines, uh, really a militarization of the European Union to a level that never existed before, uh, where in some ways it may be independent formally from NATO or from uh, other US military alliances. However, we see it, of course, contributes directly to the militarization or uh, growing threats from NATO, uh, as well as NATO adjacent alliances. We have AUKUS that was mentioned by a few of our different presenters, and of course, the RIMPAC drills, which include uh, 26 countries in total, eight of them NATO countries, and four uh, being NATO allies in the Asia Pacific region, uh, which also have increasing military budgets in many cases. Uh, so we see really a, a growth in this, this quote unquote Western uh, movements, uh, growth in militarization uh, to unprecedented levels uh, since the Cold War, but even uh, prior to the Cold War, there was nothing quite like what we're seeing now. Uh, and the growth of these military exercises in particular, the RIMPAC exercise, uh, representing such a large group, bringing in countries that are formerly outside of these alliances, but that are nonetheless now involved in this military provocation. Notably, uh, China has been left out of those military exercises, I, I think I heard since 2018, but correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on that. Um, so we see, we see that, we see uh, the threats to the existing world order with the economic rise of China, as uh, Walden had just pointed out, um, as well as the war in Ukraine and many other features. Uh, Reiner had mentioned the new NATO documents uh, does not uh, mention China in it, or uh, NATO-China relations in particular. Um, and there are very few words in that document from the current NATO summit on the India-Pacific region. Uh, while on, in some ways we might interpret this as to NATO is staying out of Asia, we see clearly, very clearly, that that is not the case and that many of these NATO countries are involved in other military alliances or these drills, and it goes much beyond NATO as a formal alliance itself. We see other alliances, we see uh, these military exercises, RIMPAC, uh, that are really challenging that order. Uh, we see a number of, of threats uh, at this moment, and rights laid out very well in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we have the very close proximity of the Korean Peninsula, Japan, China, and Russia. We see uh, the strengthening of US Taiwan relations, uh, militarized relations more than anything, in a way that directly seeks to challenge the one China policy. Uh, we see the islands in the South China Sea and the Freedom of Navigation Act. Uh, that the U.S. is carrying out there, um, as well as battles over uh, influence uh, and, uh, in some way, colonization of many of the Pacific islands. Uh, nowhere is this more true than in Guam and the North Mariana Islands. Uh, these are areas where we see colonization and military bases taking such a large uh, parts of not only the land, but also destroying the natural resources of the population and ignoring the legitimate demands of the indigenous peoples of these islands. And these are just some of the consequences we see from the military actions we have, of course, as well, uh, the sinking of a ship as part of the RIMPAC drills, which as, as much as they may claim, they try to make it green, it's very much not the case. Uh, and we see, of course, the military is one of the largest polluters, uh, especially the US military, uh, which really has a negative impact on the region. Uh, let me just take a look at my notes here. We are seeing ourselves in the middle of a Cold War of sorts uh, for this new world order that's involving NATO alliance, China, Russia, and the global south as a whole is now being asked in many ways to take sides or to become involved militarily. We see that those who will suffer most are the uh, the people of the islands in the Pacific uh, and other nations that are on the front lines of the conflict between the great powers. We see in Ukraine right now as well, the great suffering of the people of Ukraine, uh, which are caught between power policies of the NATO alliance and the West and Russia. 
So what are our solutions? Where can we go from here? We saw many really great recommendations and current actions that are taking place. We've seen the protests against NATO in Madrid. We had the 24 hour peace wave that went around the world with voices for peace. Uh, we have this petition uh, against RIMPAC for canceling RIMPAC. Uh, we have global voices for solidarity uh, for the people who are on the front lines of these problems we're facing at this moment. Uh, we see the need for intersectional movement, intersectional movements, excuse me, to come together uh, to really bring together uh, people who are working for the environment, who are working for indigenous rights, who are working for uh, uh, gender equality, who are anti-racist activists, and the need for these groups to come together because we see peace really is the overlap of all these issues. Uh, that peace cannot exist without justice and justice equally not without peace. We need to continue to pressure our governments on one hand to end these military exercises that we know are provocative and on the other hand uh, for more long term commitments. Uh, con things such as common security, uh, which Rainer Braun had talked about, a uh, big, very big initiative of us at IPB, uh, the need to understand that one nation cannot uh, achieve security at the expense of another nation and the need for cooperation, diplomacy, dialogue, and disarmament policies, that we cannot continue to increase military budgets and hope that that will somehow create peace. We need to unite uh, on all of these issues to march and also make long-term effective change. So I will end there because I think I've spoken enough at this point, but thank you again to all of our speakers so much, Sean, for that amazing summary. Uh, thanks to all the speakers and Katarina, Anu, Reiner, uh, Monica, and Walden. Thank you so much for, for joining us. We send you solidarity with your Bible case as well. Uh, I want to thank Annette, Cora, Nina, and Divine, as well, and also uh, Vishnu for having taken the time to help make this webinar possible. And uh, last but not least, I want to welcome all of you to check out, join, get involved with the organizations that, uh, that hosted this session, particularly the Peace and Security Cluster at the Asia Europe People's Forum, the International Peace Bureau, Transform Europe, and International No to NATO, No to War, and the Pacific Peace Network. Thank you to the viewers and participants. Um, lastly, this video will be available on our Facebook um, page of Asia Europe People's Forum. It will probably also be available on International Peace Bureau, and it will be made available on the AEPF website. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.